All right, let's go now to uh, Kurt Wolfork. He is from Minnesota and with Mosaic Company. Hey, Kurt, how's it going today? Pretty good. Excellent. All right, so what kind of questions are you getting right now from farmers or agronomists about nutrient deficiencies really in any crop? What's popping up right now? Uh, basically, much like Brian said, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of guys are just trying to play catch up. And, and again, just echoing what Brian said there, I mean, we really preach and teach all of our retail customers and growers to, to start out with that sound fertility program, you know, that balanced crop nutrition. And uh, yeah. I know it was tough uh, for a lot of people, especially, you know, western Kansas, as Brian mentioned, with the drought and stuff to spend money. But it's uh, it's very crucial to, to get that done. So, you know, we're seeing, <clears throat> I think you mentioned it before the break, but uh, we're seeing instances of sulfur deficiency. And, and that can be, uh, as you mentioned, confused with a zinc deficiency and sometimes right. nitrogen, def- nitrogen deficiency. If, if people don't uh, fully understand, you know, mobile versus immobile nutrients in the plant, whether to look at the, you know, upper young leaves versus the old lower leaves and kind of which nutrient deficiency is found in which part of the plant. So those are some of the questions coming up for us. Right. So to quickly summarize that, if you're listening today, you're going to see nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium deficiencies. If If it gets so bad, you see visual symptoms. Those are going to show up on the lower leaves. Whereas sulfur, zinc, many of the micronutrients, that's going to show up as a lighter shade on the upper leaves. So that's how you how you determine the different classes. But, you know, that's the thing with sulfur and zinc. It could both be a yellowing on the top leaves. So it's hard for me to identify those. Do you feel 100% confident you can always tell the difference between sulfur and zinc deficiency? No, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, ironically, I was... Uh, I was down in Brian's part of the world uh, about three weeks ago doing some uh, trial visits with Kansas State University professor, and we uh, came across a cornfield, you know, that I absolutely uh, would have put 90% that it was a sulfur deficiency yep. and it was a zinc deficiency. So, you know, that really that really underlines the importance of the, the tissue sampling, as yeah. you guys have been talking about here. And, and again, I just I want to reiterate, I know that you've probably covered this uh, to great lengths, Brian. Uh, But, you know, working with that soil test lab or that tissue testing lab and getting the guidelines from them, there's multiple resources out there on, you know, which part of the plant do you take, at what growth stage, how do you handle that. You know, you never put uh, a fresh tissue sample in a a plastic Ziploc bag. A lot of times we air dry these out or put in special envelopes that the the lab can provide just to get the best analysis and uh, make sure your calibration numbers from the lab are, are coming back correctly, you know. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it's funny because I like to think, well, I've been an agronomist for many years and and we farmed, you know, since I was a kid and everything. Oh, yeah, I can tell the difference between one nutrient deficiency and the next. And you can't always do that. So I have learned that I'm not maybe as smart as I think I am. I'll trust the data from the lab more than anything. All right. So what else? Anything else unique this year? I know in Minnesota, there's been a lot of flooding and that kind of thing. Anything popped up in those areas that you don't normally see? Yeah, I mean, we definitely, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the yellow areas of the fields that you see, as you just mentioned, are, are due to standing water, you know, and and obviously corn and then other crops as well can tolerate, you know, cool water, cool temperature, much longer than when it gets warmer, uh, like it is now, and so, uh, you know, often growers, you know, if if they're not uh, well versed in nutrient deficiencies or or uh, tissue sampling. I mean, it's it's easy to mistake, you know, maybe an area of uh, nitrogen or sulfur deficiency when flat, you know, the crop just needs some sunlight and time for the the soil to get some air and the roots to grow. So, How about soybeans? What are the top one or two things that are showing up deficient that you've seen in your region? I haven't got to spend just a whole lot of time, Brian, in the soybean fields here in Minnesota yet. I've spent most of my time uh, further south and kind of working my way north, so I don't have a real good feel for those at the present time. Okay, yeah, we. I guess the other big thing with soybeans, and for everybody listening today too, just understand the soybean plant needs a lot of its nutrients late. So even though for corn, yeah, we're getting toward the end of things in terms of putting nutrients on, I mean, we are just at the beginning for soybeans. Once those beans start flowering, and especially when they start potting, they're going to need a lot of nutrients every day. So we talk a lot about 
uh, potassium and phosphorus and some micronutrients at that point. Well, Kurt, thanks a lot for being on the show. Really appreciate having you. Yep, Brian, if I could just add one last thing, cropnutrition.com is a great resource to look at for any of these crop nutrient deficiencies. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. This is Ag PhD Radio.